Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope that you're finding this year's annual conference knowledgeable and enjoyable. It is my pleasure to present the Public Facilities and Improvements session of this conference. Next slide. I'm just going to go over some housekeeping notes. Um, it will be good to know uh, during this webinar. The uh, presentation is provided through PowerPoint and it's a recording that will be available on the HUD exchange. Um, we don't have a scheduled date yet, but it will be very soon. During the webinar, participants will be in listen only mode. Closed captions can be viewed using the show captions feature below on the video player. Consult the attendee guide for more information, and it's available on the resources page of the event website. Next slide. Questions. Submitting content related questions using the Q&A feature located below the video player. You may need to scroll down the web page to view the Q&A section of the webinar. You're encouraged to submit questions throughout the presentation. You do not need to wait till the end of the presentation to submit your questions. However, we will hold off until the end of the presentation to answer the questions. Next slide. Chat. For technical issues, request assistance through the chat box on the right side of the screen. Additionally, questions relating to technical issues can be emailed to the email address provided. Next slide. Questions. If you would like to access questions while simultaneously viewing the event, an example without scrolling down, download the Slido app on your phone or go to Slido, which is provided in the link in your web browser. Then type in the code for this session. The support team is posting the Slido code for this session in the chat. You can also scroll to the bottom of the page to find the Slido code in the session description. Next slide, please. And to start the Public Facilities and Improvement webinar, eligible public facilities activities include infrastructure such as streets, sidewalks, water, sewer facilities, and lines, neighborhood facilities, parks, playgrounds, recreational facilities, facilities for special needs, populations such as homeless shelters and group homes. Next slide. Eligible CDBG CV public facilities activities include Construction of a health facility for testing, diagnosis, or treatment. Rehabilitate a community facility to establish an infectious disease treatment clinic. Acquire and rehabilitate or construct a group living facility that may be used to centralize patients undergoing treatment. Acquire a building and rehabilitate it to provide single occupancy housing units. Rehabilitate a facility such as a homeless shelter or senior center to allow social distancing in common areas, such as dining and recreation rooms. Next slide. And this is the uh, eligible CDBG CV public facilities activities continued. Construction of a public facility such as a park serving in an LMI area to provide suitable outdoor fitness and social space where insufficient facilities are available to support social distancing guidance. Acquire and rehabilitate, if necessary, a motel or hotel building to expand capacity for non-congregate shelter or enable permanent housing where such housing is not sufficient during a coronavirus pandemic or epidemic. Rehabilitate a community facility to establish appropriate ventilated spaces for senior or youth services and activities. Next slide.
Constructing a public improvement, such as extending broadband infrastructure in an undeserved area or reconstructing degraded water lines to support teleschool and telemedic and to ensure potable water to homes, schools, and health providers. Rehabilitate a commercial building or public facility, such as a school building to improve indoor air quality and ventilation to improve public health and prevent the spread of coronavirus by replacing the HVAC and other building systems or to add operable windows and other improvements that could ensure the building's continued usefulness during the outbreak. Next slide. Some of the activities that I stated in the previous slides are identified in the April 30th, uh, 2021 CDBG CV tieback flexibilities guide. Um, and it's also available on the HUD exchange if you needed any further information. Going into special assessments. Special assessments are used to recover capital costs through a fee or charge. Under CDBG, two ways to think about special assessments are, one, to recover the costs of CDBG assisted public improvements, or to pay private assessments for low mod owner occupants. Low mod area of benefit may be limited to only low income persons when grant funds are insufficient to pay for all low mod income persons. Next slide, please. Ineligible public facility activities include, but not limited to, maintenance and repair of public facilities. There is an exception for handicapped accessibility operating and maintenance costs, exception for costs related to carrying out a CDBG public service activity in a public facility. Buildings for general conduct of government, an example, City Hall, has some exceptions. Next slide, please. That's our last content slide. Okay. And I do have uh, some information in regarding the ineligible public facility activities. Um, the regulation is uh, 570.207B. It allows CDBG funds to be used for operating and maintenance expenses of a public facility if used to carry out a public service, even if the public service is non-CDBG assisted. This expense is eligible as a public service and subject to the 15% cap, unless it is a public facility used to address coronavirus. Public services for activities used to address coronavirus are not subject to the 15% public service cap. And at this time, we will take our questions for uh, our Q&A, the ones that have been submitted and also have an open discussion available for more questions. I am including uh, Duncan Yetman here to assist me with the Q&A. <laughs> um, and we are ready to get started. Okay. So I have a question. The first one is, is there a trend for type of public facilities currently and who are the best public partners? Yeah, good, good question. Um, <clears throat> so, so as you know, or, or, or you may know uh, from your own experience, um, uh, public facilities is not a high priority for the use of CDBG CV funds. Um, our early data indicates that uh, from the first, you know, couple of years of the pandemic, that 85% uh, or more of our funding is being used for public services uh, and for uh, economic development activities. 
uh, not for public facilities and improvements. So um, there's not really a trend that we can see with regard to the use of CDBG CV for public facilities. Um, uh, but your best public partners are the ones that, that we noted uh, for you, even in the earliest days of the pandemic back in March of 2020. Uh, one of the things that HUD suggested uh, at that time, if you look at the early guidance that's on uh, HUD.gov and on the HUD exchange from March of 2020, one of the, some of the early guidance that we provided to you at that time was to consult with your local public health authorities uh, about the use of CDBG CV funds. Um, they can tell you, uh, you know, what, um, uh, what public facilities uh, in terms of meeting the CDC guidelines or um, addressing uh, uh, other issues with coronavirus, what public facilities have been found wanting uh, and need assistance. Uh, they can help to work with you on that. Um, uh, public health departments are, have a wealth of information. So you should partner with your public health departments as much as, much as, as it makes sense for you to do so uh, in terms of the expenditure for your dollars, uh, especially if you're looking to get certain public facilities up to snuff with regard to social distancing uh, guidance or, uh, or what have you. So uh, good question. Thank you. Great. Uh, there was a question that came through that uh, my colleague Gloria Coates answered. And it was a question regarding, can rooms be rehabbed in a city hall to allow for COVID testing? Gloria has answered the question with the answer, CDBG funds cannot be used in any space for general conduct of government activities are being carried out. An example, administrative. Thank you, Gloria. You're welcome. I wanted to also say that uh, in some of the smaller communities, there are buildings that are city hall, but they're also public service, you know, where they do public services because they're smaller areas, you know, your smaller cities. And so if you have a place that's separate and distinct from where the general uh, conduct of government is being held, let's say if you have, you know, a place on the second floor and, you know, all this is on the first floor or, you know, a, a separate and distinct space where there are no government activities, you can use that space to rehab. Um, and provide for COVID testing. But it's very, you know, but it must be made clear that it cannot be anywhere else. And these activities must be, you know, kept distinctly separate. Not only that, uh, but that a national objective is met. Great, thank you, Gloria. Duncan, do you have anything to say on that? No, 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 that, 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 that's good. I mean, I think, um, you know, what we've most been seeing, I'll get back to the, the, the kind of trends, and, and this is basically, I guess, based on trends that we've been seeing based on questions asked uh, of us uh, in HUD headquarters. Um, we've been at, we've, been seeing questions particularly about the use of CDBG CV funds um, to provide uh, PPE uh, in public facilities, uh, personal protective equipment, um, whether that would be, you know, like plexiglass screens or um, for people who have a necessity to be in uh, government offices for their workspaces to be uh, sectioned off. Um, again, the, the, uh, uh, the criteria is to have the connection to coronavirus, that there has to be a tie back 
uh, that the funds have to uh, prepare for, uh, prevent, uh, and respond to coronavirus. Um, uh, and, and, and so um, if that particular town facility, let's say your PPE for employees in a town facility, if that town facility is geared towards meeting a CDBG CV uh, national objective, meaning that that particular office, let's say is the community development office um, of the town or the county or whatever uh, jurisdiction you're in, um, then that would be an appropriate use of um, uh, uh, dollars to, to, to provide assistance to, to improve uh, that facility because that's considered a, uh, um, uh, an activity delivery cost of whatever it is that you're, um, you're providing. It, it, it may also be, you know, if you have a question about that though, I would submit it to your field office because it may also be a program administrative cost of a particular activity. It depends on, 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 um, on, on how you've set it up. So uh, any details on that, we would recommend that you uh, get in touch uh, with your local um, CPD field office uh, and, and, and ask them about that. I, I do also want to mention um, that um, there is a uh, CDBG CV public facilities quick guide uh, that was published in June uh, of last year that is available that will help you uh, sort through and determine uh, both eligibility, national objective, and PPR tieback for uh, uh, any public facilities uh, projects that you're thinking of engaging in. Okay, great. Um, while we were discussing the last question, we had another one come through. The question was, are parks considered facilities and not infrastructure? Gloria did answer the question stating that parks are considered public facilities under 570.201C. Yes, yeah, yeah. Something also to note um, while we're waiting for some additional questions, um, uh, and, and that may be indicative of why we do not see a greater use of public facilities with CDBG CV funds. And this is the, um, uh, the three year uh, period of performance that uh, requirement that grantees expend 80% uh, of their CDBG CV grant uh, within three years of initial grant agreement. Um, uh, and, and that's because public facilities take time. They take time to construct and they're expensive. Um, and so if you're putting all your money into the construction of a new public facility, uh, you may not be able to meet, uh, or you may be very hard pressed to meet that 80% expenditure requirement within three years. So it's another, uh, it's another cautionary note. If, if you're still thinking about public facilities, think about the time frame. Uh, if you're going through uh, a substantial amendment to your CDBG CV uh, plan and you're thinking of adding a public facility, think about that expenditure requirement uh, while you while you are while this idea is still kind of in the germination stage. And, and, and think about whether um, the use of funds for public facilities may endanger your ability to meet that 80% uh, expended within three years requirement. Okay, thank you, Duncan. Um, let's take another question. Can community development block grant funds be used to fund broadband telecommunication projects? If so, how? Um, okay, there two, that's a two part question actually. If you consult the regs at 570202G, as in good, it talks about um, the use of CPG funds for broadband 
infrastructure uh, when there's substantial rehabilitation um, to a building with more than um, four rental units, uh, which is going to be uh, rehabilitated. It says there's a definition of substantial rehab at 5.100 of what is considered substantial um, rehabilitation, but any substantial re uh, of a building, as I described before, um, has to include installation of broadband infrastructure. Um, and there are a couple of um, exceptions to that um, that are located in the regulations, but generally um, it's actually a requirement um, that's statutory. Now, with regard to other um, broadband, um, depending on what's needed and what's installed, it could be a public facility and improvement activity under 57201C. Uh, the national objective being low and moderate income area benefit. Duncan, anything to add? Uh, no, no, that, that, that pretty well covers it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, nothing, nothing to add there. Um, um, yeah, the, more is spoken about in broadband in a quick guide that we have as well for CDBG CV. Um, so um, uh, Pay attention to those to those quick guides as well for for additional guidance. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, and Duncan. Okay, I'm going to um, take another question. Um, when such facilities are owned by a nonprofit or sub recipients, they shall be operated so as to be open for use by the general public during all normal hours of operation, how can a domestic violence shelter or group home be open to the public? And the, uh, the person that's asking this question says that this is stated in 57201C. Yeah, so- To repeat it? Um, I, 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 can, I can answer this, uh, Chelsea. Um, so uh, open to the general public, uh, during all normal hours of operation. That basically means is that um, this facility is not something that um, is private. It's not something that is an exclusive club for private operation. Uh, a uh, domestic violence shelter, uh, uh, a shelter, uh, an emergency shelter for the homeless. These are all facilities that the general public wouldn't come wandering through, but um, they are available to people uh, who meet that limited clientele criteria um, and during their normal businesses, hours of operation, whatever would be considered normal for that, uh, for that um, particular facility. So um, that's how they meet that requirement. Um, uh, and, so, so that so that's how those particular public facilities um, serving as housing um, uh, meet that. Great, thank you, Duncan. Okay, I have another question. Are CDBG CV funds considered a formula grant? Yes, they are. Right. Well. Uh, yeah, they are, yes, and, I, and I'll, I'll add to Gloria's answer there to say that um, uh, CDBG CV funds are an emergency supplemental appropriation of community development block grant funds. So they are formula funds. They're not part of an, an annual formula uh, uh, appropriation or allocation. HUD will not be allocating additional uh, uh, CDBG CV funds annually, 
it's kind of a one-time emergency supplemental um, uh, allocation. Got it, great. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. Okay, I have another question. Do you have any guidance on upgrades to a kitchen at a shelter, new appliances that would be eligible for replacement or installation? More information is needed on this because it depends on what they're doing and why. I mean, for a facility that has a kitchen in it, but it may not be integral to what they're doing, it may not be necessary to use CDBG to upgrade its kitchen. I mean, you know, like a rec facility may have a kitchen, but if they're not distributing uh, food, um, then doing their kitchen may not make a lot of sense. However, if you have um, a food distribution facility that's preparing food um, and storing food that will be um, distributed uh, to income eligible persons, you know, using from food banks. Um, CV money can be used actually um, if there's a huge demand and they don't have adequate, let's say, freezer or refrigerator space, then they can purchase an additional freezer or refrigerator as long as they can tie it back to demand um, because of the pandemic that this additional refrigerator, this additional stove um, or a, a larger one is needed to meet the demand um, for food because you know people lost their jobs, they can't work. But even now in 2022, when you know people are, a lot of people are back working again, um, not everyone is, and there still is a demand. So as long as the pandemic exists and they can tie it back to pandemic demand, they can use CDBG, C, CDBG CV. I mean, of course, they can also use annual appropriation CDBG funds also um, for this activity. Great, Duncan. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I'll just say that that um, you know, if it is a kitchen providing food to the residents of that shelter, then the appliances within the kitchen are an eligible use of CDBG funds, not necessarily CDBG CV funds, um, uh, but definitely CDBG funds. Um, there has to be a particular tie back to coronavirus uh, for the use of CDBG CV funds. Um, yeah, if you're making, um, if you're somehow segregating duties within a kitchen uh, to, 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 to maximize uh, social distancing, among the kitchen employees who are serving the residents, the shelter, there, there may be an eligible use of CDBG CV funds, but I can't imagine that particular activity. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. Okay, I'm going to take the next question. Can you use CDBG? and CDBG CV together when acquiring or rehabilitating a motel? Yes, yes but I don't yes. recommend it. Reason being, there are different requirements with regard to CV that aren't applicable to regular CDBG. I mean, the regular CDBG program you really didn't hear of grantees of using CDBG to acquire hotels to shelter the homeless. They may have built homeless shelters for that purpose, but because of the pandemic and they wanted to get these people off the street and not have them spreading coronavirus, a lot of grantees may have decided to use their CV money to acquire or rehabilitate a motel 
for the purpose of temporarily housing the homeless during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 in many cases, you know, the uh, grantees have been encouraged, and they've done so. They've acquired, you know, motels, uh, uh, and and provided both transitional and permanent housing in, in those facilities to, uh, to maximize social distancing um, of their, their clientele during a pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. I've got a, another question that's come through. Would the installation of a generator be an eligible public facilities activity to ensure that an HVAC system, for example, functions during a power loss? That's a good one. <laughs> Sounds like a regular CDBG activity to me, more so than one that addresses coronavirus. Right. Right. If that public facility is otherwise meeting a national objective, serving uh, low and moderate income persons, um, you know, either on a limited clientele or area basis, uh, a uh, an HVAC system would be would be an eligible use of CDBG funds. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. Okay, I have another question. If you plan to do a public facility project that would make accessibility improvements to a government owned building, how or what do you measure as the beneficiaries? What kind of data do you need to provide in IDIS? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I, 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 can, I can tackle this one. Um, so um, this comes under the exception. Right. Uh, typically, uh, buildings for the general conduct of government uh, cannot be assisted with CDBG funds. But if you are addressing uh, providing accessibility improvements, um, uh, providing improvements that uh, uh, enable um, uh, uh, the, the disabled to access the facility, um, then uh, these are eligible. Um, these are eligible improvements. And the clientele, the, the beneficiaries of these improvements, uh, they're the general public, but they're also the disabled. So when you set this activity up uh, in IDIS, the IDIS activity setup screens, uh, depending upon the matrix code that you select, and there's a particular matrix code for this in IDIS, um, they will direct you they will populate the proper screens so that you can know, um, you know, who the beneficiaries of the activity are in IDIS um, uh, based on this particular activity. Um, yeah. All right, I have another question. If a food pantry is looking to get additional funding to open a kitchen to provide hot foods for the community, are there other funds besides CDBG they can apply for? Yeah. There are probably the, the, the other source of HUD funding uh, that comes to mind is ESG, mm -hmm. uh, the SGCV. Um, those, those dollars, uh, would be available. Um, uh, you'd have to look at the particular, uh, requirements, uh, but, but I know of, of, uh, uh, many, um, you know, hot food kitchens, uh, soup kitchens, even, even food trucks and, um, soup trucks, <laughs> if you will, that have been funded with ESG. Um, so uh, those, as far as HUD goes, that would be an eligible source of assistance. You would want to look, I think, to uh, other local and state resources that may be available to you. Um, you know, whether that would be um, 
uh, you know, some of the agencies that are part of a local United Way um, or um, uh, those, those, you know, th those type of agencies, um, different philanthropies, uh, local or regional may also have an interest uh, in this particular um, uh, service area. Uh, and, and, and so I would, I, would, I would reach out to them as well. Great. Uh, Gloria, do you have any input on that? Or am I able to move to the next question? Yeah, yeah, I think I would go to the next one. Okay. Okay, I would just say Department of Agriculture may have something. USDA. Oh, that's true too. Yeah, Department mm -hmm. USDA may may also have some programs available. Mm -hmm, definitely. Okay. And the next question: Our need assessment, planning, and development studies for public facilities considered planning costs. 20% cap or part of public facility cost? Good question, good question. They are considered planning costs. They are program administrative costs. Um, un until the time that a national objective can be met. So um, let's say um, you're having a study done of a group of public facilities. Uh, for compliance with the American for Disabilities Act. And you're gonna, you're gonna, and any projected improvements to these public facilities, you're gonna be um, using CDBG CV or CDBG funds for. Um, uh, up until the ability for a national objective to be met, those planning costs, the, the cost of that planning study, um, would be a program administrative cost and have to fall under your administrative cap for the use of your CDBG dollars. Um, but once uh, uh, that uh, activity uh, comes to fruition uh, and, and it can meet a national objective of the program, whatever that activity is, um, uh, you can lump that in with the project costs and it can become a activity delivery cost of that particular activity. Uh, the, the, the problem is, is that we see many planning costs and many administrative costs that don't lead to anything, right? Um, that don't actually end up meeting a national objective of the program. So um, that's the caution there. And, but, but if a national objective can be met, um, uh, those planning costs can be folded into um, uh, the activity delivery costs for that uh, for that particular activity. It's similar to uh, engineering and architectural costs uh, in terms of um, uh, an activity as well. Uh, you know, if, if you've gone so far down the road with architectural and engineering costs, but the project never gets built, you can't, you can't charge those as having met a national objective because the project never got built. Um, you have to charge those to your uh, administrative costs. Anything you want to add there, Gloria, on that? Did I did I sum up that right correctly? Yeah, but I did want to just add one point. Okay. If you already know uh, that you're planning to do a public facility somewhere and the type and all of that, and you're just doing a feasibility to study to see if... Um, it would be well received or whether there's a need. Um, you can, and if it can be directly tied to that activity, then it would be an activity delivery cost of that activity. But if you're just trying to determine whether or not you, you know, you need recreation centers on this side of town or you need uh, homeless shelters on, that side of town, or if you need, let's say I'm a DC native, if you need homeless shelters in North Washington, you know, Northwest Washington, DC, uh, you know, things like that, then yeah, that's because it can't be tied to a specific activity. It's a planning and admin cost. But when you know you're doing something 
and the cost is directly associated with it, then it's an activity delivery cost. Hopefully I didn't confuse you. No, that, no, that's good. That's good. Um, I would also point folks to uh, our notice about distinguishing between um, program administrative costs and activity delivery costs. Um, that's notice, CPD notice 13-07. Um, I think I have that right. Um, and uh, uh, you can find that um, uh, both on the HUD exchange and on HUD clips. Um, thanks. Okay, great, thank you, Duncan and Gloria. I have another question. If you have annual CDBG funded park improvement project and you want to add a few elements to the park that have PPR impacts, can you supplement the CDBG project budget with CDBG CV funds for the PPR related costs only? thus prorating the project with PPR elements and non-PPR elements. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what, what it, what's meant, what the question are meant by prorating, but um, it, let, let, let's get, let's, I'll give you an, let's get, let's kind of put this kind of into an example. So let's say you're, you've started working on a park uh, and then the pandemic hit and, you're, and all construction stopped while you went through a redesign, let's say, to, uh, to, to put some social distance aspects um, to, um, to make the park more accessible um, during the pandemic uh, to address any deficiencies that may have been in the current design that, you know, can be addressed, uh, again, to, to enhance social distancing and um, otherwise address issues with the pandemic. Um, you can do that. You can supplement that original CDBG project budget with CDBG CV funds. Uh, I, I think that would typically be done uh, through a change order, a project change order on the project. Um, if the project is not yet underway and you're finding that the need to do this, you probably would have to, um, uh, you know, depending upon what stage of um, pre-project that you're in, uh, you may have to even bid the project out again. Let's say uh, you're deciding to do this uh, after the bid has been awarded, uh, but before construction begins. You may need to um, go out to bid again uh, to give all the bidders a fair opportunity to bid on all elements of the project, uh, including uh, th those with the now the the, the, new, um, the new elements uh, that are being funded with CDBG CV. So um, uh, if you have specific questions about dates and timing and all that kind of thing, I would contact uh, your CPD field office rep and, uh, um, and, and see, how, uh, see how you can bring that about and, and make sure that you're fully compliant. All right, thank you, Duncan. I have another question. Can you walk through an example of record keeping requirements of special assessments within the state CDBG program? Hmm. <laughs> well, um, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, I, I think, so um, uh, special assessments, I know it's called out in our regulations and there's even 
uh, a lot of language about it in our guide to national objectives and eligible activities, if you're familiar with that guide. Um, but it's very seldom used. I, I know it's, it's used by a couple of grantees in particular areas of the country. Um, uh, but uh, as far as as far as the record keeping requirements of special assessments in, in state CDBG, you're best to put that question to your field office rep uh, in the state CDBG program. You may uh, also wanna hold this question and ask it again uh, if they talk about special assessments within our uh, uh, presentation of the state CDBG program um, that's coming up. Uh, later this week, I think that's on, uh, I think, is that on Friday or tomorrow? I'm not sure. Do you know, Chelsea? It's, Friday. it's the last Friday. day. Okay. Is it the last day? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. on Friday, we're going to be having a presentation on state CDBG. So if they get into special assessments or record keeping, uh, you may want to, you may want to uh, address it with them. Okay, great. I have another question. How long must a facility remain unchanged that has used CDBG funds for a rehab? Okay, that's a good, so, so this is getting, this question is getting at a, uh, a requirement within the program uh, uh, with regard to uh, real property activities. This is what we refer to um, just internally at HUD as our change of use provisions. Um, and um, if you look at uh, our change of use provisions, uh, which are uh, 570.505, 24 CFR, 570.505, they outline there um, the change of use provisions, both for uh, recipients, for public facilities under their control and for subrecipients, for public facilities that are under a subrecipient's control. So you want to uh, excuse me. reference that. And Gloria, I'm sure you have something uh, to add to that as well. I'm sorry, change of use for subs is 24 CFR 570-503-B7. Okay. Yeah, so that's- I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to point that out before I, yeah. you know, you, I yeah, would have forgot and, to- And actually, I think I think 505 points folks to 503B7, doesn't it, or no? Maybe. No, that's specific for grantees. Yeah, okay, so 505 is for grantees. 503B7 would be the change of use requirements for subrecipients. And- Yes. Um, it, it's it's five years for grantees, right, Gloria? Um, only if they um, give up their status and are leaving the program. Otherwise, it's forever, as long as they're grantee. In right. perpetuity, Important. unless they give up their status. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you put a new roof on a senior center uh, and... Um, uh, that senior center remains in town control, you've got to, that senior center continue, that, that building continue, has to continue to operate as a senior center if that's how you established eligibility for it with the use of CDBG funds and putting that roof on there. As soon as it stops being a senior center, then you have a change of use for no matter how far you go out. Right, that's right. Uh, for grantee, yes, but I do want to point out that some people get the idea that if you change it from one type of public facility to another, that it's not a change of use. That's not true. It is still a change of use because, as Duncan said, um, you know, a recreation center, for example, is usually targeted toward, you know, uh, youth and young adults and or regular adults where senior centers centers are just for seniors of a particular age as the grantee defines it. Therefore, it's a change of use and subject to the requirements and the regulations. Yeah, yeah. 
Great. Okay. Let's have the next question. Thank you, Duncan and Gloria. The next question is, if a center serves a, as a presumed benefit population, but was in danger of closing due to an emergency repair, would this be eligible? The emergency repair or the moving of the people? Doesn't state. Yeah, so, so it's unclear what, what particular rehab activity, if that's what the activity is here, um, uh, is the rehab considered an emergency repair or is the questioner asking because the building is closing, uh, is it somehow now out of compliance because it's no longer serving a limited clientele population? It's mm -hmm. unclear. Maybe if you, if the questioner could restate that, um, yeah, it's unclear what they're asking. Yes. Please resubmit the question with clarification. I have another question that's come in, um, and it's a, a simple question. <laughs> It says, so Friday's basically CDBG course day three, session A and B are for states only. Uh, no. no. True. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. The, the session from 145 to 345 on Friday will cover the state program. That two hours, yeah. just that two hour segment on Friday from 145 to 345, that will, that will cover states. Okay. Maybe if we could get that other question. Yes, yeah. we're waiting. If another question goes up, we'll certainly tell y'all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, I had someone from my session earlier, so they'll probably do it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that other question that was asked, if, if maybe we could take a look at that. Um, about uh, emergency closure. Um, I'm kind of scrolling to it now. Um, I mean, I'm looking at the relocation regulations. Yeah, let, let, let's, let's, let's assume it's not a relocation situation. Let's assume that this is um, uh, 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 well, just for ease of uh, providing an example, a presumed clientele population being seniors, and that it's a senior center that had to close due to an emergency repair. There was a, a water main break, and um, it was a significant repair, not only in the street, but in a lateral line to the senior center, and the senior center had to close for a month. Um, that would not jeopardize the use of CDBG funds for that particular center, if the center, let's say, had been constructed with CDBG, any amount of CDBG, uh, the fact that it had to close for a month would not jeopardize meeting a national objective if it was an ongoing uh, facility. Um, that, yeah, I mean, a national objective is met uh, once the facility is constructed or rehabilitated and opened. Um, then a national objective is met. There's not a, a time frame that a facility has to be open to meet a national objective. It's met right then and there once it opens. Um, uh, so, so a closure wouldn't affect an existing facility. But if you're asking, does that emergency repair, would that be an eligible expense? Uh, yes, that, that also, it, it would be a, a, an eligible expense. Um, uh, for that particular public facility if it meets a limited clientele national objective because you have uh, an eligible activity and you've got the national objective tied together. Yeah. Okay, I want to chime in for a second. Okay. Okay, let's, there's a homeless shelter, which is a whole different ball of wax. Sure. Okay. And and it had the same issue and they had to close it and get the people out of there because of the mold, mildew and everything else. There you go. That's what 
we go to the to, to the relocation regulations because um, it talks about someone being displaced um, when they move from real property or move their personal property from real property permanently and involuntarily as a, de a direct result of rehab, demo, or acquisition, or an activity assisted under this part. But now it said, notice you said, it said for an activity assisted under this part. And then it goes on to tell you what a permanent involuntary move means. Uh, it, this is uh, more than um, really what this, for the purposes of this presentation, but I would presume that in a case like this, you would have to be able to relocate those people to another to another space. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Emergency yeah. repairs being made, and it would be considered a cost of operating because, I mean, you can do operation and maintenance of a public facility where public service is being provided. And in most homeless facilities, they also have, you know, um, job training and other services, counseling and other services that they provide to the homeless that are there. Yeah, those, those relocation costs are an eligible cost um, for that particular activity. Yeah, they're, they're eligible under CDBG. Yeah, but I, I mean, but since the question wasn't clear, you right. know, I, the senior citizen, yeah, but I just, I, I just want to kind of th throw in case if they were talking about something that was a little more nuance, you know, a homeless facility, a center for runaway teens, you know, a place where they have folk and they're there, you know, because, you know, 201C talks about persons having special needs is what they, you know, call it. Yeah. Are you all ready for the next question? Sure. <laughs> if our city is currently more than 51% LMI citywide, then can we make public facility improvements at any part in the city? Uh, uh, depends on... Yeah. Go ahead, Gloria. Okay, I'm sorry, Duncan. Um, it depends because most cities have more than one part. And each park doesn't serve the whole city. I mean, uh, you know, there's Rock Creek Park. And, it, and, and I mean, I, you know, when I lived in Southeast, I wouldn't travel, you know, 50 minutes to get there. I would stay in Southeast where Anacostia Park is, for example. You know, so it can't be said that each park has a service area of the whole city. Most of them serve the area in which they're located. So you'd have to look at each one on an individual, you know, an individual basis to determine if it will meet the area benefit national objective. Now, if you have something huge, um, that may, and there's nothing else like it, um, then that may serve the entire city, your city. But then you run the risk of having something that's big enough where it may attract folk from outside. This, yeah, this as question well as, is really a service area question, right? We do encourage you as grantees to select the, the easiest national objective for you to meet for, for any activity. And with a park, um, that is typically low mod area and uh, national objective. Uh, low and moderate income area national objective, but uh, here this with this park it's a it's a service area question, um, uh, and as, as Gloria noted, if this park uh, if a park has unique features that it is the only park within the the community that has these features, 
and your community is 51% low mod, then clearly the service area for this particular park is the entire community because people are coming to this park because of these unique features, whether it be a splash pad or, um, you know, uh, 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 a swimming pool or whatever it may have uh, that, that makes it unique among uh, the parks in the community. Uh, and so for that reason, its service area is the entire community and therefore it would be eligible. Where we most often get this question is with libraries. Uh, and we get this question with libraries uh, among grantees who um, uh, are upper quartile grantees, grantees that don't have uh, an area of their community with 70% or more low mod uh, um, uh, in them and uh, use an upper quartile percentage to establish um, their uh, top 25 uh, census block groups um, that are uh, the top 25% census block groups that are low and moderate income. And they want to know, you know, if we make improvements to the library, it's used by everybody. Well, the library is used by everybody in town. The library may be in a low moderate area, uh, for instance, in, in the way many of these questions are posed, but the library serves everybody in town. And if the town is not 51% or more low mod, uh, uh, or if the town does not exceed uh, the upper quartile threshold, then no, you can't, you can't make those improvements with CDBG funds to that library. So um, uh, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And really it's a service area question. So you wanna, uh, we would point you to the, the guidance that's found in our guide to national objectives and eligible activities on, on uh, determining the service area of an activity. Great. Thank you, Duncan and Gloria. I have a question that has um, come through the chat. I believe that the person is asking if it was needed to move the elderly group from the public facility permanently. I think this ties back to our question that we had. Let me see if I can find the original question. Bear with me. I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, if it's serving the elderly and you're talking about moving them, that usually would be some type of group home mm -hmm. specifically designed for the elderly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, if you the thing with the um, persons with special needs type of facilities, the issue is, you know, we say public facilities are not considered permanent housing. They're transitional housing. And for most group homes, those are not really very transitional. Or if they are, I mean, you're there 10, 15, 20, you know, it's a long time. So I think in, a, in an instance like this, if you were doing substantial rehab on an emergency basis, or even on a non-emergency basis to address something um, and they had to move, then I think they could be relocated while the improvements are being made um, and then move back. But if it's gonna be um, permanent, um, that's a whole different question because generally we don't, how do you say this? We don't provide long-term housing for the elderly or for anyone. That's not what CDBG does. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Thank you, Gloria. Um, we have yet to receive the clarification on um, the one question, but I just had another question come in. This is uh, one of our attendees. Not sure who is asking, but what if it's senior low income housing in a floodplain and they need it to be moved out? That wouldn't be our responsibility. Um, I mean, the only way CDBG is used to pay relocation is if they, they're moving permanently and voluntarily, it says here, uh, because of work that's being carried out with CDBG. For example, they're demoing the home, the group home, or it needs very substantial rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a, another question that's come through. If a nonprofit applied for rehab funds on multiple group homes, would that be entered as one activity in IDIS or multiple individual activities? That's a pooping question. <laughs> Can you restate the question? Sure. If a nonprofit applied for rehab funds on multiple group homes, would that be entered as one activity in IDIS or multiple individual activities? Yeah, it would be multiple because if these are multiple group homes, which I assume are not all on the same site. So we need, we need a separate activity documented in IDIS for each separate address. Yeah, they would be separate activities. Okay. I've got a uh, question that I believe ties to these last questions that we've spoke of with group homes. Um, when you say group home, is that the same as a senior center? No. No, I mean, a senior center is, is typically... Um, a uh, facility operated by uh, a jurisdiction or its subrecipient that um, you know provides social and recreational uh, and some and social services uh, to seniors within a community. Um, there's no typically no residential component of uh, a senior center. Correct. Any other questions? Not as of now. I was checking to see if some were coming through. As of now, we do not have any further questions. We can, uh, oh, one just came through. <laughs> a comment, actually. <laughs> it's not long-term housing. It is in an area in an event center. It's not long-term housing? Mm-hmm. It is an area. Previous question? I believe this ties back to... The previous question. I'm sorry, Gloria, what did you say? No, I'm sorry. If it's not long-term housing, it's an area and event. It sounds like a leisure facility, like Duncan was talking about earlier, if it closes. You know, a senior citizen, they have activities directed for seniors, things mm -hmm. uh, that they like to do. I mean, I'm stereotype them, but backgammon and um, bingo, bidding clubs and, and things that seniors like to do. Yes. Thank you, Gloria. <laughs> I have another. I mean, I'm not, 
put it explaining everything, but I think that's what they're talking about when they say events. You know, it's a place to give seniors a place for recreation and other activities that they enjoy. Right, and it is open to the community, correct? Nope, seniors only. Well, <laughs> um, okay, let me clarify something. Mm -hmm. With regard to a senior citizen, I mean, I'm sorry, a senior center, mm -hmm. the grantee may define senior or elderly however it wants because it's not a permanent housing activity. Some grantees use 55 and older, some use 60, some use other ages. We can't tell a grantee that 50 is too young if that's their definition of senior. Mm -hmm. But activity is limited to people who fit the, the age demographic and they have to prove that they are in the correct age demographic uh, to be able to use the senior center. Now for housing activities, the comp plan regs require that the definition of elderly for housing purposes is 62 and older. But for other activities, the grantee can define elderly or seniors however they want. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria. I have another question. If CDBG is used to purchase real property, is there a certain number of years after which the property can have a change of use without returning the return of CDBG funds? If it's owned by a subrecipient, it's five years after expiration of the subrecipient agreement, or if the grantee has imposed a longer period of time than when that period expires. Some grantees have a 10 year. And once it's met, uh, 10 years after the agreement expires, then the subrecipient can do with the property whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. The grantee that same flexibility. Uh, most grantees don't relinquish their status. So that means that it has to uh, be used for purpose that meets a national objective in, in perpetuity. They could change the use whenever, you know, I mean, at a later date and time. But if it doesn't meet a national objective, Repayment is going to be required. Now, if the grantee gives up its status, it's five years after they've completely closed out their CDBG program that it won't, they can change the use and it won't be subject to our program requirements. Mm -hmm. okay, great. Thank you, Gloria. I have a, another question. Can you have something to add to that? No, no. Okay. I have another question. Can CDBG CV be used to convert a conventional four stall and six urinal bathroom into seven separate small rooms, each with a toilet and sink in a nonprofit neighborhood facility? I will repeat that one. <laughs> can CDBG oh, I can see CV be used to convert a conventional four stall? and six urinal bathroom into seven separate small rooms, each with a toilet and sink and a nonprofit neighborhood facility. What type of neighborhood facility was it? Non what? Nonprofit neighborhood. Nonprofit, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, Gloria, you wanna tackle that? Sure. If they're gonna do this with CV, they have to demonstrate how converting this bathroom in this manner is going to prevent coronavirus. And this is one of those things, I'm not quite sure how you do it because yeah. I, women's bathrooms are different. Ours are, you know, but I guess men is it's a little more open. So I guess they said if you're standing next to someone, they may, you know. So I can kind of see them doing it. 
if they can clearly document the need for it. It has to be necessary and reasonable. Uh, the part 200 requirements don't go away. Yeah. So I, mean, I would yeah. think. I, I think a lot so of this. Gonna, there has to be it has to be necessary and reasonable. And I think what the grantee, it's incumbent upon the grantee to to show the PPR type act documentation and to document it to the to to the greatest extent possible. And and that may include um, you know, so um, we know that, that several jurisdictions around the country have their public health departments through contact tracing have decided that certain businesses, for instance, can be open and certain businesses have to close just based on the contact tracing data that they're getting that indicate that certain businesses tend to be breeders of, of um, uh, or, or, or places where uh, the infection is being transmitted. So with regard to a neighborhood nonprofit public facility, if, 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 if the public health authorities are finding that, wow, contact chasing is showing that this public facility is a hotbed, that that's where all these people who are showing up with coronavirus have in common, that they've all been visiting this particular public facility, then yeah, you've got some pretty strong documentation for uh, in order to keep this facility open, providing adequate um, uh, social distancing measures within the facility and using CBG, CB funds to do that. But you need the documentation. <laughs> you can't just say, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we gave everyone their own stall, you know, when they, uh, no. Um, it, it, it really needs to be supported by the evidence. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. I have a, another question. Please clarify about housing rehab project versus sites. For instance, if a nonprofit owns multiple housing locations, couldn't you update or enter them in the IDIS setup screen for each location that it is rehab? Wouldn't it be one project with multiple sites having an ID in the setup? Okay, you're saying they own, what are you talking about, multi-unit structures? It didn't quite say if it was multi-units. I believe they might be scattered sites. It says multiple housing locations. The um, reason I ask Nonprofit generally doesn't own and rent single unit housing, or I mean, they may own a building where <laughs> they you know, rent apartments, but I've never heard, you know, usually that's a private rental. Not to say it couldn't happen, but mm -hmm. in general, um, they may own buildings. So if if the grantee has multiple housing locations, which we are thinking may be a, like scattered sites, how would they go about entering them into IDIS through the setup screen? Would it need a ID setup for each location or could it come as one full project versus sites? I believe that's what they're asking. Could it be- Japan can probably answer that as well. Um, any questions regarding IDIS setup probably should be saved for Friday. Um, I mean, I tried to send an email uh, to see if I could get her attention, but she's in a different, you know. Yeah. She's in a different- Typically, just so she typically when it comes to IDIS, on. yeah, typically when it comes to IDIS setup, uh, I didn't exactly hear the question. I don't see it in our chat here, but. Um, I have, I copied it. If a nonprofit yeah, owns so, multiple houses, yeah. couldn't you enter them in the IDS for each location that's rehashed? Typically we wanna see a separate entry in IDIS for each location. 
if it is one project, meaning um, uh, there is one project budget for all the different locations, then you would know oh, okay, wait a minute. Okay. locations in an IDIS setup screen. Yes, you would. You would note all the different okay. for that particular activity in an IDIS setup screen. And, and um, there, there's, a, there's a means to do that within IDIS. Uh, and if you have okay. any questions about that too, you can go to um, setting up a real property activity or rehab activity in IDIS and within the IDIS online manual. Okay, I got the answer back from her with regard to the rehab funds on multiple group homes. And she said for entering it in IDIS is one active is entered as one activity per group home in IDIS. Yeah, but That's if it's, her answer. it's uh if if it if it's actually one financing mechanism to work on all the group homes together, there would be separate addresses entered in IDIS for the one activity. Okay, because what I did, I copied the question as it appeared yeah. and sent it. Okay. And that's what she said. Yeah, me. I mean, it. you know, um, if, if it turns out that what the grantee has done is incorrect in IDIS in terms of how they set it up, that can be corrected. But typically, if, yeah, if you're spending just for ease of, you know, explanation, let's say you're spending $100,000 on 10 group homes, $10,000 in each group home, and it's one agency that's doing it, and it's a $100,000 project, um, um, and it's one contractor, and it's one contract, you would do that as one activity with 10 different addresses, 10 separate addresses. Typically, uh, unless you are tracking expenditures, it, it, I mean, if, if you are tracking expenditures, um, uh, you know, separately for each house, um, for each home, um, you may do that. You may, you may set that up differently, but I think in terms of ease of reporting, because it is one contract and it's one contractor, you would, you would just have the one activity in IDIS with, with 10 addresses. You can add multiple addresses for an activity in, in IDIS. Uh, this is kind of, I think it's kind of similar to a, a, a grantee who runs a, um, uh, a housing rehab program. Some grantees set up uh, a separate activity for each house. Some grantees have a housing rehab program activity with several addresses that they that they list underneath it. Um, yeah. I mean, I've heard of that, but um, because I don't personally don't have a good knowledge base with IDIS is why I reached out to prepare. I understand. I understand you did, yeah. I'm a grantee, yeah. you know. <laughs> yep. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. I have a comment that was submitted to one of the previous questions regarding the um, public stalls and urinals. Um, someone did say social distancing. Many businesses are public in public buildings have blocked off stalls and urinals in public restrooms. They wanted to make that comment. Yeah. Yeah, they may have private money. Yeah. Uh, again, I, 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 I think how, whatever you do, whatever you decide to do, make sure that you've documented your rationale for why you've decided to do what you're doing. Um, and if that can include a conversation that you've documented with the local public health authorities as this being a good way of um, reducing transmission of the pandemic and meeting social distancing guidelines, et cetera, et cetera, um, by all means do so. 
because the more documentation you have in your file of the reasonableness of your costs that you're incurring, the better for you. Okay, thank you, Duncan. I have a, another question in the queue. If CDBG funds are used to acquire and demo housing units, permanently relocate housing occupants per URA, what is the CDBG payback requirement? The property is to be sold by the subgrantee for commercial and industrial development. That question is not complete because, um, okay, yeah, if they acquire and demo, um, let's say substandard housing units, then yeah, they have to relocate those occupants because those people are being permanently and involuntary displaced because you demo the house, they have nowhere to come back to. Uh, so I don't know what they mean by payback requirement. Um, you have to probably check the URA guidelines. That's deeper than this type of discussion to determine how much mm -hmm. has to be paid to each per, you know, each household. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of different nuances with that. And I'm not familiar with that. There's a relocation specialist in our Office of Affordable Housing Programs. And generally when we have questions on URA, that's who we send our questions to. Yeah, you can get, and, and they have many resources available on the web. Um, our, 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 our Division of Relocation Assistance within our Office of Affordable Housing Programs. And, um, um, uh, some very useful resources on how to navigate URA and how URA applies to uh, HUD-assisted activities. Okay, great. Thank you, Gloria and Duncan. Um, as of now, there are no questions in the queue. Um, it could be... Okay. Gloria's decision if you wanted to wait around for a few minutes just to see if some come in or. Sure. Yeah, we can wait. We can wait a few minutes here. Um, we'll use the time to um, just to, to reiterate again for those who may have uh, joined us late uh, or whatever that um, there is a uh, CDBG CV public facilities quick guide. Uh, available on the HUD exchange. And um, uh, I would reference that if you have any questions about um, how to set up um, a CDBG CV assisted public facility uh, activity and, um, um, you know, find there what, what other types of, uh, what types of those activities may be eligible uh, and how to, um, just how to how to run that. Uh, it's a it's it's called a quick guide, but it's fairly lengthy. <laughs> it's about, I think ten pages or so. So uh, uh, there's a lot of information there. Great. Yeah, I think if there are no additional questions, we can we can consider signing off now. Okay, well, I just want to uh, definitely thank you, Duncan, for joining in and assisting me with this. And uh, you also, Gloria, I really appreciate it. And to thank the participants and attendees for joining the webinar today. I hope that it was knowledgeable and enjoyable. And everyone take care. <laughs>